think I'm going to stay down here if I can, be a little bit closer. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. I really need to thank the president of the academy and the, mem uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the academy and the guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Some friends that I've known in, in Spain for quite a while. It really is an honor tonight to be part of this institution, especially when you look back over the history of over 400 years old. So the city where I come from, Chicago, is only 150 years old, and the university is a little over 100 years old. So this is a, a really a great honor to be here tonight. And I really want to express my appreciation for honoring me with being a foreign member. What we're going to be talking about are these two ideas, uh, racemates and optical activity. And I realize probably many of you don't under appreciate fully those two terms. Chemists in the audience clearly understand the idea of racemates uh, when you have both the enantiomers of the same compound. And in general, usually one does not associate this property, the rotation of light, <coughs> optical activity, when you have both enantiomers or the racemates. And so basically that's the theme I'm going to be talking about tonight, connecting those two. But let's start with a little bit of language that we use in solid state chemistry and as chemists with symmetry. And we'll start, I picked this for an obvious reason. If you're in Spain, you visit many of these places and see this beautiful artwork. And there's a whole literature on this um, these are in two dimensions, these structures, but I'm going to focus on them maybe in a slightly different way, the Moorish ornaments, sort of the designs of the Moorish people, in terms of if they have a center of symmetry or not. So that's going to be a persistent theme tonight. And a center of symmetry is simply the inversion center. Um, and so with these groups, we can break them up into the non-centrosymmetric and centrosymmetric groups. And they're color-coded here. For example, the central symmetric would have this often called the wallpaper groups. And there are 17 of these groups, and they belong to 10 point groups. Seven are non-central symmetric, <clears throat> seven are non-central symmetric, and 10 are central symmetric. So that's going to be another theme, separating them based on their inversion symmetry. It actually turns out, if you read this literature in the world of art, that all of these have been observed, um, fifth, fifth, 13 of them have been found in Granada and Alhambra, and the other two have been found in Toledo. Two evidently still have not been observed in the art world, but they're known in chemistry. And so in chemistry and in crystallography, these are called the plane groups, the symmetry that's possible in the flat world or the two dimensions. So this is just an example of one of the non-central symmetric structures and one of those central symmetric structures. And you can see just visually that if you lack this inversion center, the structures are much more complicated. The one they have the center of inversion, they have a more regular pattern in how they repeat and how you would build up the piece of art on the, wor on, on the wall, right? So this is one of the features of being central symmetric and non-central symmetric. So you can imagine then, there's a lot of interest in just understanding the origins of, of structures that are central symmetric and those that are non-central symmetric, lacking inversion. They're very important in the world of physics, for example. So, we've seen then in these Moorish ornaments, these are good examples of symmetry in two dimensions, but tonight, what we're going to be talking about are three dimensions. They're important in all of the physical world and especially in solid state chemistry. And because of this, many useful properties live in materials without inversion symmetry. So in the field of material science, when a structure lacks inversion symmetry, many very interesting physical properties are possible. And that's what this diagram summarizes. And I'm really fortunate tonight to members of my research group in the past who've done a lot of this work, Professor Hala Samani from the University of Houston and Roman Gautier from Nantes and the CNRS Institute there are both here. So I'm very happy, so glad you could be here tonight. And this is a diagram that we published some years ago 
that just begins to list all of the materials based on the fact that they're non-centrosymmetric. And there's actually then 21 of these possibilities. So we're going to be counting these numbers often tonight and we'll come back to them. But we've grouped them. Um, these are the ones that have some dipole associated with them because they lack inversion symmetry. The so-called polar groups. The ones in this ellipse are the ones that are piezoelectric. And there's the possibility then that you can have second harmonic generation. If you shine light in at one energy, it can be frequently doubled or quadrupled or even the sixth form, right? So this is NLO, nonlinear optical behavior. In this group here, these are the ones that are enantiomorphic or chiral. And so that's the ones we're going to be focusing on more tonight than these others. But this is a very useful way to look at all of the different kinds of properties. The other one tonight, because we're going to be talking about things that are racemic or the two enantiomers or one of them is chiral, with those versus <clears throat> and the property of optical activity. And so optical activity can be observed with any of these symmetries here. So let's just think of a few important materials that we all know though, let's relate it to that. So the, probably the most important is alpha quartz and it's um, enantiomorphic and this would be its uh, symmetry. Other materials that we might recognize, KTP, in this one it's a polar material. <coughs> Lithium niobate and barium borate, the basis of almost all of the um, um, uh, uh, phones and how we signal. Barium titanate, probably the most important ferroelectric material, is a, one of these polar symmetries. Other ones like urea and ADP, they don't fall into the chiral or polar, <coughs> but they would show optical activity. There are other materials that can both display chirality and polarity at the same time, these five here, something like lithium iodate. So I'm just going to briefly mention a little bit about the NLO behavior before I go to the topic tonight, racemates and optical activity. So another area in our research group that we've worked on is designing materials that can span the spectrum from the far infrared through the near infrared into the visible and then into the near UV and the deep UV. And these materials <clears throat> at this end are particularly challenging to have them be transparent in the deep UV. For example then, this very famous material which is this potassium beryllium boron oxide fluoride or it's just abbreviated as KBBF. This is a material discovered in China some years ago and is still sort of the benchmark of, of, a, of a deep UV material that can display uh, NLO behavior. And this is an example of what a crystal of that would look like. <clears throat> Recently, uh, Shiv and I and a few others have uh, published this paper where we've just, in the last, what, 15 years or so, there's been many materials now designed to function in the deep UV. Let's just look at a few of them and some points. So this is below 200 nanometers. And this would be for, this would be for an all solid state device if you had these materials. This one is, at a, this is the Excimer laser at 193 nanometers. Here's the 157 millimeter, nanometer laser, for a fluorine Excimer laser. So these materials are all solid state compounds. Many of them are borates. Here's uh, KBBF uh, here, which is transparent uh, well into the deep UV. So a lot of our research is on, on trying to understand how to create materials, not just by accident, but by studying all the interactions, understand how to make uh, deliberately a material that's non-central symmetric as opposed to central symmetric. And I think in the field, the, it's really made a lot of advances and one does that now uh, uh, still with some serendipity, but one can plan these experiments and often make a material uh, that is non-central symmetric. <coughs> but tonight we're going to be talking about racemates and optical activity and Roman has had a lot to do with that and so we're going to focus on these four symmetries. 
And you notice that they, all of them would show optical activity. These are the 11 enantiomorphic groups. And these four, because they're not in this ellipse, they're actually then called the non-entiomorphic groups. But they also should show um, circular dichroism, for example, even, <clears throat> for example. And so, <clears throat> let's just go through this history a bit, this path from optical activity from racemates. So the first observation of optical activity was in quartz a long time ago, 1811, before one even understood atoms and crystal structures, right? That isn't done until the early part of the 19th century. The first observation of optical activity from mirror image quartz crystals was reported rather quickly then in 1822. And this is the famous experiments that probably many of us studied and learned about in school from Pasteur. This was then the first observation of the cancellation of optical activity from racemates because he could uh, show that if you had both enantiomers, you wouldn't see it. And if you had one in one crystal and one in the other, you could still observe the optical rotation of light. Now we're going to fast forward to the discovery of the laser. And in 1962, Futama and Papinski, they made the first observation of optical activity from a non entiomorphous crystal. So let me just go back. Whoops. So it was in one of these symmetries. Now this has nothing yet to do, there's many structures, they don't have to involve enantiomers at all, but they're in those groups. But till now then, there's been no observation of optical activity, optical activity clearly from racemates. So as a chemist, we found that rather strange, and so one should be able to see optical activity if you were in one of those four non-entiomorphic groups. So that's what I'll tell you about tonight. So what the first thing, or one of the things we did, was go and study the literature and go to the two databases, the Cambridge Structural Database, which is largely organic and hybrid type materials, and the Inorganic Structural Database. And so these are the four symmetries, 4-bar, four 4-bar four 2M, M, and MM2. And so when crystal structures are reported and uh, deposited in the databases, that's one of the key pieces of information that you can find. And you can see that there's quite a few of them. So this isn't rare or unusual to be in these non-central symmetric, non-entiomorphic groups. So there are quite a few materials that in principle would show optical activity, over 40,000 of them. Now, we estimate that of these structures, probably 5% of them are racemates. The others are other solid state structures made up of atoms and uh, whatever in terms of, you know, their crystal structures. So even there, there's quite a few uh, racemates forming in these structures. So let's just go back now to the IUPAC definition. And this is what would be in a textbook today. One pair of, of molecule entities which are mere images of each other and are non-superimposable. That's what one enantiomer is. A racemate then is an equal mixture of a pair of these enantiomers. And the IUPAC definition is it does not exhibit optical activity. And we, the chemical name or the formula is distinguished from those of the enantiomers by a series of nomenclature and prefixes. But the simplest way to look at that, as we all know, is just in terms of our hands. And they cannot be superimposed one on the other. And so you could take a molecule, a tetrahedral molecule, with a central carbon atom, typically, with four different atoms here. And this is the mirror image. If there was a mirror plane here, this one is here, this one is there, here, here, this one over there, etc. But you can't superimpose the two. And so why are these important? This is an important question. One of a pair of molecules, an enantiomer there, is one of a pair of molecules which are mirror images of each other and are non-superimposable. So limonene and in the R form or the S form, you can see that this is here and this is here. Other, and this is a perfect mirror image. This one gives the flavor of an orange flavor. This one is the flavor in a lemon. So they have a different 
response, right? Another example is in terms of uh, dihydroxyphenylalanine, the two isomers. This one is toxic. This one is a drug for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So there's this huge interest in enantiomers and racemates and having one over the other and being able to separate them, etc. So how do we distinguish them? <clears throat> if you have a, a light beam with a random orientation of, of light and you have a filter, you can make what's called then a plain polarized light. And so all of the light is oscillating in this plane. If you had one of these molecules, this is optical activity or the rotation of light. One of them would rotate the light relative to this point to the right and the other enantiomer would rotate the light to the left. So this is the difference in how you would identify the two. So how to distinguish them? If you had a mixture of them <clears throat> in an equal amount, then some of the light would go one direction, some the other, and so one doesn't see the optical rotation. So this is what's always associated when you had a racemic mixture. If they were, uh, had the ability, to, if they're moving and have free motion. So how to find such racemates in the solid state? So this is a phenomenon, the optical rotation that we're talking about, associating it with racemates, is a phenomenon in the solid state. And so the answer is racemic compounds belonging to one of those four enantiomorphic groups, M, MM2, these two, or 4-bar or 4-bar-2M. Enantiomorphic compounds belonging to these 11 groups have what's called then no improper symmetry operation. Yes, they are non-sensor symmetric, so there's no inversion, but there's also no mirror plane and no roto inversion. And so there is a clear distinction between this group and this group. <clears throat> so let's go through this concept again, starting back with the early <coughs> discoveries in quartz. So if this was the quartz crystal, there would be no optical rotation perpendicular to the optical axis. And because beautiful crystals of quartz existed, one could do these experiments uh, early on in the 1800s. If you change the direction, the orientation of the crystal with respect to the uh, uh, light, optical rotation can be observed along the optical axis. And so that's what essentially was done in these experiments <coughs> in quartz. And so now let's just change, begin to think of it in terms of just the handedness or, uh, argument that we always use. <coughs> this is if there would be no rotation in this direction. There would be rotation if you reoriented the crystal. And so if your hand was perpendicular to the beam, you could imagine it one way, or if it was in the plane of the plane polarized light, there's clearly a difference of how the light interacts with the molecule, giving rotation. And so in Pasteur's experiment, two mirror images forms from op opposite op optical rotation, you would have the light beam, your hand, the, the one hand like this, the other hand like this. One would rotate the light as shown here and shown here. So now we're going to have two concepts. We're going to have the concept of handedness, but also the direction, the anisotropy. So <clears throat> if the light is oriented with respect to the object this way, no rotation, rotate 90 degrees, there would be. If you had the other handedness, no rotation, rotated into the, the sh uh, this orientation with respect to the optical beam, you would get rotation in the opposite direction. So now let's combine that. Let's imagine this is our crystal in the solid state and we're going to have the two hands oriented this way or this way. In either case, you would get no optical activity in any of the directions in the crystal. However, in the same crystal, if the two crystals, if the two enantiomers were oriented this way. This is, just, this is just a simple way of imagining how this effect can happen. 
Now, in the four non-antiomorphic groups, there's quite a few other ways to orient the objects or the atoms relative to each other. But overall, this is a good way to begin to think about it. And so if you would rotate 90 degrees, this one would go this way, this one this way, but you would still see optical rotation from this object or from this one. So half of them, it's seeing one enantiomer but not the other. So now let's think about how we actually then did the experiment. So we want to think about breaking the inversion symmetry in racemates. So we took a simpler model compound from coordination chemistry. The bipyridine ligand, this is a pyridine molecule, pyridine molecule to join through this carbon-carbon bond, these are the two nitrogens. And it's well known how they arrange <coughs> forming six bonds through the nitrogen to the central metal atom. This could be a copper ion or a zinc ion. And I'll show you a few more examples in a minute. But this is like a propeller on a plane. And it can go clockwise or counterclockwise. And so we show one arrangement going this way and this way. So these, they are mirror images, but they're not superimposable. <coughs> so if A is equal, let's just uh, start arranging them in space. If they're equal to one another, and we, don't, we didn't design the ligands in this way, then this would be the central symmetric case, and it's, op not, uh, and it's not optically active because it's central symmetric. It, it, it doesn't have an inversion center. It does have an inversion center. But if we made these particular cations, or ions, and we arranged them so that A equals B, but they were all of the one type, this is an enantiomorphic compound, and this would be chiral resolution. So in chemistry, this is a very important point, that depending on how you do the chemistry, if you had both enantiomers, of trying to resolve them into one structure or the other, right? And if you had chiral resolution, you would be in a chiral space group. It's non-central symmetric. It's not polar. And it would show optically activity. This is one of those 11 I was talking about. But if they're not equal to each other, if A and B are, are different, that is one is one enantiomer and the other is the other enantiomer, so one is one propeller going clockwise and the other one is counterclockwise, this one would be uh, non, it's not chiral, the overall structure, it's polar, and it's in this point group MM2, and it would show optical activity. So this is what we're seeking. So we made, in our experiment, we made these compounds with two pyridine ligands, a water molecule, two plus cation. And depending upon what anion we crystallize them with, the hexafluorohafnium anion is a rather large anion. The smaller BF4 tetrahedral anion shown here, there's the HF6 anion here, the BF4 tetrahedral anion here, one of them <coughs> um, was central symmetric uh, and one non-central symmetric and indeed polar. So this, with this bipyridine ligand then, we could, uh, they form these layers in the structure and we could follow the symmetry, the up and down uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the particular enantiomers. And in one case, we had inversion symmetry, and the other case, we didn't. And so they're very chemically similar materials and structures. And this is the experiment then, the optical, uh, observing the optical activity. So let's just go through this diagram then. So there's, of all the point groups, there's 32 that are possible. 21 are non-central symmetric. The central symmetric ones are shown in black. And these would be uh, crystallizing for our racemic compounds that were central symmetric, and there are many and many of those reported. In terms of being polar and non-chiral, there's the red ones, these two here, and these. Chiral and non-polar are shown here in blue. In purple, here, these five, they're chiral, chiral and polar. And in green, we have the non-chiral and non-polar. So here's the other two, 4-bar and 4-bar 2-M. So these are the four non-antiomorphic 
situations. And all of these show optical activity, but these <clears throat> in general have to be enantiomorph enantiomorphically pure. Right? And so there's a lot of literature on, on this phenomenon and, and, um, and complications that arise, and there's still a lot to be learned here. But clearly, it's very clear from our experiments that if you had these four possibilities, you would also observe uh, optical activity. And so here's the example using the same ligands, but here we had an anion and it was in a, it made this uh, crystallize in a central symmetric structure. And this is the circular dichroism spectrum essentially. This is the change in absorbance as a function of wavelength with single crystals <coughs> aligned along that, those optical axes. And here's the same experiment where we had a non-central symmetric a structure with the same cation, four different experiments. So it's the same experiment on the same face of the crystal, so we're repeating the experiment multiple times. And in this case, uh, with the racemic compound, you have no optical activity, and with these racemic compounds belonging to one of these four point groups, clearly one can observe the optical activity. We also did this with another uh, enantiomorphic compound um, in terms of another, again, bipyridyl ligand, two of them, but with this different symmetry, but this also is non-central symmetric and chiral. So here's a summary then of, of racemates and optical activity and showing some of the uh, molecules or cations that we use. So if, there, if the two enantiomers are related by an inversion center, these, this is central symmetric. If they're related by rotoinversion, one would have these cases, and these two are the two polar ones. If they're related by mirror or glide planes, then you have polarity, all of these, and these are the two, other two non-antiomorphic groups. Um, and these then are the, if you had chiral resolution or something called crypto racemates, which I really haven't discussed tonight. But that's another very, very active field when the, because of the solid state structure, when the molecules are perturbed and the two enantiomers are not exactly equivalent, right? So this is another uh, uh, whole active area and it's very interesting, and there's a lot yet to be learned about optical activity when you have molecules, two mo both enantiomers. But in the cases where you have, in these four cases, when you have both enantiomers, you clearly can observe, and they're identical. Here they're not being perturbed. Both enantiomers are, all the bond distances and all the angles are identical, but it's the orientation of them that can lead to the observation of <coughs> optical activity. So opto, optical activity from these uh, racemic compounds in these enantiomorphic groups. Okay. One last comment, and this is also important. Um, <clears throat> so this is in the solid state, a crystal. But what about in solutions and powders? So optically active racemic compounds in these point groups are clearly important. For these point groups, the tensor describing the optical activity is, is of symmetry 4 bar m. So the optical activity is equal and opposite in the two perpendicular axes of the single crystal. And they would cancel if you had a, a powder or, and so you have to be, this is what you would observe if you had in a single crystal. This is a very nice paper by Bart Carr who explains this aspect of it in Angavanta Kami from a few years ago. So, let me just conclude with reminding ourselves what the IUPAC definition is. An equal molar mixture of a pair of enantiomers, I've we've seen this before, it, it does not exhibit optical activity. The chemical name or formula, blah, blah, okay? This is always true for powders and solutions. So most of the time this is a true statement. But it's not always true for crystals in the solid state. Right? So I, we've searched the literature for papers and we believe this is then the first real clear uh, example of optical activity from racemates in these particular cases. But I think it also has a great deal of implication 
for <clears throat> the crypto racemate stories and in those other non-central symmetric situations because again in the solid state there can be many interactions that affect the local symmetry. So um, on that I want to thank everyone. It's been a real honor and I wanted to show this picture and say muchas gracias Miguel. This photo is from 2006 and uh, Amparo Fuentes is here. She invited me to Barcelona and the Chemical Society of Spain meeting and it was my first trip to Spain and uh, this Miguel was there. Miguel and I knew as he said in his introduction we had known each other for a while <coughs> but um, um, this was um, I really have always appreciated <coughs> the interaction with the Spanish scientific community and it's been a real honor and I hope it can continue for many many more years. So Miguel thank you very much and to the Academy, thank you very, very much for this honor tonight in becoming a foreign member of the Spanish Academy. So thank you very much.